Um, so today I'm going to be talking to you about a uh, library I wrote called uh, Bounded Integer. Um, the ultimate goal of the library is that it um, will automatically track the bounds of an integer type throughout various expressions um, using type deduction. And then it can use these bounds to create more type safety and more performance. So I'm going to start out by describing the problems of current approaches related to integers in C++, uh, then move on to other attempts to fix the problem, and then finally, what this library does differently. Okay, so to start off with, let's say we have this expression. By a show of hands, how many people think that this is undefined behavior? We have uh, the maximum int plus one. Okay, it is. It's uh, integer overflow. Uh, you can uh, set that to wrap around uh, using, uh, for instance, GCC, the F trap V flag. Uh, on some architectures, it does wrap around. On other architectures, it's a, it's a trap. Um, but in general, it's undefined behavior, and compilers do optimize, assuming that this never happens. Um, for this, negative one is less than an unsigned zero. How many people believe that this is undefined behavior? Okay, good, nobody. Uh, how many people believe that this is a true statement? Negative one is less than an unsigned zero. Okay, you're right, it is false. Because <coughs> when you have a negative one that's an int compared with an unsigned zero, that negative one is implicitly promoted to unsigned, which then becomes the largest possible unsigned value, wraps around, and then on most systems, 4.2 billion is gonna be greater than zero. Um, how about this statement? How many people think that I would not have put this slide in if it were the exact same as the previous slide? Um, this actually is implementation-defined behavior. It's probably false, but on some systems, such as some old Cray systems, this could be true. And the reason for that is because unsigned could actually be a 64-bit integer instead of a 32-bit integer. And then you have a uint32t gets promoted to the 64-bit int and then you have negative one is less than zero, and it actually returns true. So you can't necessarily rely on uint32t being the same as unsigned. Um, another uh, possibly tricky one, how many people believe that size of int is greater than or equal to two? Correct, it is not necessarily. On most systems it is. Size of int is typically four, but it can actually be as low as one. Again, on those Cray systems I mentioned, size of, uh, Everything is one because a uh, char is 64-bit, short is 64-bit, int is 64-bit. Everything is 64-bit, and that meets all of the standard requirements. Um, then we also have the uh, the types in uh, going more into the types into the header C standard int that was added in C++ 11. Uh, int 8t, a type that's exactly 8 bits in size if it exists. So we set it to 48, and we print out the negative value of it. Prints negative 48 as expected. We have int 8t, we set it to 48, we print out the positive value of it. It prints out 48 as expected. But if we just try to print the value, you might think, oh yeah, I would print 48, we assign the value of 48 to it, but on most systems it'll actually print zero because the ASCII value of zero is 48. And int 8t is typically just a type def for a signed character. So when you pass it to standard C out and try to print it, it's interpreted as a character because a type def does not actually create a new type. Um, then we have another interesting scenario here. You went 32t, x is zero, y is one, and z is two. So the question is, is x less than y minus z? So is zero less than one minus two? It's probably true depending on size event, similar to the, the previous slide comparing negative one to uh, a you went 32t zero. So in summary, we have undefined behavior for signed overflow. So if you ever have undefined behavior in your program, there are no guarantees anymore whatsoever about what your program will do up to that point, before that point, after it, anywhere. Because a compiler will see, oh, you know, you're doing this, but we know that you could never possibly do undefined behavior. So we're just going to optimize out your checks, optimize out code that relies on that. We're not gonna take branches. It's gonna change the generated code. Un unsigned overflow wraps around. So if you have negative one to unsigned, it suddenly becomes a very large value, and this can lead to unexpected results. Comparing signed and unsigned values is confusing because if they are 
the same promotion rank as int or unsigned, so basically the same size as them, then uh, the integer value is promoted to unsigned. So any negative values become very large. If they're smaller than an int, then they're both promoted up to int, and then they behave as expected. The header, the types in the C standard int can be characters instead of integers, so printing or other functions that you specialized on a character type instead of an integer type can be called instead, leading to situations that you might not expect. And so just in general, integral promotion rules are unexpected. So the question is, how do we fix this? One possible solution, use a big num. Uh, this uh, fixes overflow issues, and comparisons work as expected. But in exchange, it's slow. You have a heap allocation. Every time you create it, you have indirect operations, indirect comparisons. Uh, the compiler doesn't necessarily know that your internal pointer type doesn't <coughs> alias some other pointer. Um, it leads to pretty significant performance penalties. So for any sort of high performance application, memory constrained systems, this is you know, basically just thrown right out to begin with. So a uh, solution that many organizations do end up settling on is banning unsigned types. Uh, I've seen a lot of coding standards where they say, you know, don't use unsigned. Everything is int. This fixes mixed signed comparisons, but it does not fix any other issues. You still have undefined behavior for overflow. And if you try to save space by using int 8t or int 16t, then you still run into the realm of implicit integral promotions. So a third solution that you often see sometimes would be to create a new type of integer, uh, often called checked integer. Um, the basic idea is to check every operation prior to calculation. So you add up two checked integers, it checks would these overflow, and if they would, it typically throws an exception. Um, and if they wouldn't, then it adds as usual. So this can fix all of the issues I outlined, but it adds overhead to every operation. And for, for instance, scientific applications, or basically anything where you're dealing with a lot of data, or you're on a constrained system, adding in that overflow check can actually be significantly more, expect, more expensive than the addition itself. So if you're doing a lot of math in some loop somewhere, then this could basically, you know, you say, you know, I'd like to use it. It'd be great if I could use it. It'd make my code more correct, but it won't run fast enough. So it, doesn't matter if it runs correct if it's not fast enough for my hard real-time constraints. Um, another solution, um, or I guess uh, another prior art, I guess you could say, would be the constrained value library. Um, it was uh, proposed for inclusion into Boost. I believe it was provisionally accepted in uh, 2010. Um, it had like eight accept votes and no no votes. Um, and uh, it's actually much more general than my library. Because what it allows you to do is apply arbitrary constraints to your integer. You could say, uh, you know, this integer is always even, or it's always present in some database, or it's an integer that I haven't seen before, or I have seen before. But in exchange for that, it lacks some of the functionality that the bounded integer library has, which I'll go into later. Uh, most significantly, it does not deduce new bounds. And I'll explain what I mean in uh, just a couple of slides here. Uh, another problem that it has is that it uses implicit conversions to the underlying type. So rather than overloading all of the arithmetic operators, like plus and minus and multiply and all of those, it just has operator int. And that can lead to all of the same problems that we went through before with just the built-in integer types. Um, and there actually were a few cases where he outlined, where he gave some example code of where because of this implicit conversion, the constraints of the constrained value are actually no longer satisfied. It's kind of a way where it sneaks around the type checking system. Um, so the actual original motivation for this library was the add a range type. Um, whenever people talk about safe languages and type safety, they always talk about ADA. And the example that they always give for why ADA is safe is it has these integer ranges. You can say, you know, type my range is range negative three through 17, and it ensures that that is the range of your type. Um, it also does not denote new ranges, and it always throws exceptions. So it's basically the ADA equivalent of the checked integer class. So what bounded integer um, kind of does differently, uh, or rather its goals, I guess, would be to replace built-in integers for all use cases. 
Um, so that means that if there is any overhead at all, the library has failed. My goal with this was the zero overhead principle. You don't pay for what you don't use. So uh, it, um, it does as much of its checking at compile time as possible, and it allows you to opt in to any runtime checks that you need. Um, and what it gets you is that comparisons work as expected. It enables certain optimizations, and it also enables static analysis. Um, so first of all, where to get it? Publicly available source code. You can download it online off of uh, Bitbucket there. Um, and then one other thing I want to get out of the way is the supported compilers. Um, it only works with GCC 4.9 or later, which is the newest, or Clang uh, 3.4 or later, which is also the newest. Uh, the reason for that is because this uses C++ 14 features. Uh, primarily, it uses uh, automatic return type deduction for normal functions because the whole point of the library is that you specify the bounds of your inputs. And then you don't worry about the intermediate types. The compiler takes care of making sure that it uses the right types for the results of any calculations. And so without automatic return type deduction for regular functions, anytime you want to return the result of this from a function, you then have to calculate, okay, now the real type of this is this, and then you have to artificially constrain yourself there. It makes it less flexible for changes in the future. And there's also a few other C++14 features that I used in implementing the library, but that is why the compiler requirements are so high. So kind of some basic usage for this. This is what a declaration might look like. So it supports const expression. Uh, you'd say type name, and then x is an integer that is always going to be between 0 and 10 and has a value of 5. Um, y is always going to be between 5 and 9 and has a value of 6. So what you can do is say this. Const expression auto z equals x plus y. And the type of z is deduced to be an integer between 5 and 19. Because it just addition, you add up the lower bounds and you add up the higher bounds, 5 through 19. And then you can keep doing further operations with that. And the compiler knows and does not have to insert any checks here. The type is between 5 and 19. There's no additional overhead. It's basically ultimately compiles down to the same underlying integer addition and assignment. Um, you can print it out. Prints 11 as expected, 5 plus 6. Um, and the way that I was able to get this zero overhead while still maintaining safety is through the concept of uh, template policies. So the typical declaration here, bounded integer 0 through 10. This provides compile time bounds checking only. No operation that you will ever perform on this type has any overhead. But you can specify a policy other than the default. For instance, throw policy provides runtime checking uh, by, by exceptions. And it only does that check if it is not known to be safe at compile time. So for instance, if I have an integer that is between 0 and 10, and I assign another integer to it that's also between 0 and 10, there is no check, because the compiler already knows that it's in range. However, if I try to assign a type that's between 5 and 15, then it might be in bounds and it might be out of bounds, and it performs the runtime check. If I try to assign a type that is between 100 and 200, compile time error, because there's no possible way that that could work. Another policy here is the clamp policy. This provides uh, clamping or saturation behavior. So with that integer 0 through 10, if I assign the value of 20 to it, it's clamped to the maximum of 10. Um, uh, another last policy that currently comes built in with the library is uh, the dynamic policy. So what that does is it allows you to add further bounds onto it that can be determined at runtime and changed at runtime. Uh, and it takes another policy to determine exactly what it does if that, if those dynamic bounds are changed. So for instance, this integer has static bounds of 0 through 10. Uh, or the runtime bounds can be narrower. There's also a dynamic min policy and a, a dynamic max policy. Um, and an example of when you would use that would, oh, actually, <coughs> let me, before I get to the example, uh, I want to make a point that syntax is very important. So if you look at You look at this. This is, you know, pretty scary declaration here. It's taking up three lines on my slide, 79 characters long. Um, you know, it's pretty 
pretty bad. You wouldn't want, like if, if this is what your code looks like, you wouldn't be able to fit very much code on. It takes so much time and mental energy to kind of fit all of that into your head. It's harder to understand what the logic is actually doing. But fortunately, we have alias templates. So you can just change it to that. Defaults to the throw policy in the case of dynamic bounds. Um, yeah, so an example of using this. Let's say we have some goblin in some game. And the typical goblin has, say, four health to start out with. And you can, it can heal itself by healing one point, or it can take damage by losing one point, and uh, it returns whether it fainted, or got knocked out, or died, or whatever. Um, however, maybe every once in a while, a goblin can go off to goblin school, get a little bit stronger, and then he has five hit points or health instead of four. So we statically know that this creature will always be between zero and five. Uh, but then we have this dynamic bounds here that would be set in the constructor, which didn't fit on the slide. It would basically just say, start out the bound at four, and uh, we can kind of you know, change it later on to say five for a particular instance. But in general, all of them will always be between zero and five. And to heal it, we can just increment it. We can just add one to it. And if it uh, is going to exceed its bound, because it uses the clamp policy, it just stays right there at the top. To take damage, it can just subtract one, and you know everything is safe there. Um, does anybody have any questions so far at this point? Okay. So, um, yes. I'm sorry, could you repeat that question again? Uh, can you use uh, max, uh, in max uh, in min in, uh, mm -hmm. in template parameters? Yes, so the, uh, the type of these bounds is actually int max t. So on most systems, that means you can use anywhere between uh, negative 2 to the 63 all the way up to 2 to the 63 minus 1. Um, does that answer your question? Okay. Oh, and the question was, can you use int max and uh, negative int max, or int min, I guess. Yes? And what happens, it's a little unclear to me, if you take two of these, uh -huh. and add them together, uh, what result we get, for example, uh, if we have two of them, and we, one has a clamp policy, one has one policy, and one has another policy, mm -hmm. what's the result? Okay. So the way that, so there were two questions. The first question was what happens with mixed policies? Um, and so, for instance, what happens if you have a clamp policy and you add it to an integer with a throw policy, for instance? Is that kind of what you're getting at there? Yeah, that's my very, that's the very first yes. question. Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. So the way that this works is through uh, a uh, template class called common policy. And for most policies, there is no common policy. So if you just use the plus operator, because it cannot determine, there is no hierarchy of which is better, a clamp or a throw policy, there is no way to actually say you know, which of these policies to, determine, to use. Uh, you can use a, an add a template function and just specify this is what the result policy will be. Um, but in general, if you have uh, the default of null policy, with any other policy, the other policy wins out. The assumption is that if you wanted checking somewhere, you probably want it to go through. If two of them were the same policy, would it? Yeah, if two of them are the same policy, the result is that policy. Okay. And uh, the second question was, what happens if uh, you have two bounded integers and both of them have a maximum value that's very large, say two to the 63 minus one. Say both of them have the maximum value of the maximum possible value what happens if you add them? And the answer to that is that you cannot add them. Um, that is a compile time error because um, that unfortunately is a limitation of the library as a result of using int max t to represent the bounds. Um, one consideration that I have had to try to uh, 
eliminate that would be to allow, uh, instead of using int max t, use a type that represents an arbitrary sized integer, and then it could get infinitely large and use. Well, let's take another case, which mm -hmm. I think is a little less pathological. Uh -huh. um, Mm -hmm. And they can, it, typically the overflow would easily occur when you multiply them together. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I think that at that point, so let me, my understanding of what you said is, should we multiply two ranges together such that the upper or lower range exceeds what an int max can hold, mm -hmm. we would trap the, the, uh, the operation right there and not permit it to continue? Yes, so. Yes. Um, the question was, uh, like for instance, uh, maybe a less pathological example than adding two extremely large integers would be multiplying three moderately sized integers, and it gets very large. Um, in practice, I've actually not found this to be such an issue because um, when you are strict with your bounds of your integers, um, in most cases, you find you know, this integer is always going to be between 0 and 10. And you can multiply that together several times before you worry about overflow. And if you do get into a situation where there would be overflow, then the compiler gives you an error, and then you have to use static casts that will perform runtime checks based on your policy uh, or lack of policy if you use the, the default null policy to kind of bring those bounds back down to something that can be expressed with a uh, a 64-bit or larger integer. Um, so yeah, just when I've, when I've used it and integrated it into my own applications, just by making sure that I make my bounds as tight as possible, that problem just hasn't come up for me. I was thinking in terms of somebody could easily have a, a number close to 2 to the 32nd mm -hmm. and then square it, uh -huh. and then he'd be SOL. Yes. Um, well, in that case, he'd be running into undefined behavior by using int. Uh, the compiler just wouldn't catch it. So he would then have to, for instance, explicitly specify that the target type is going to be the largest possible range, give it a throw policy, do the add, and... Um, no, he would have other problems. Yeah. Uh-huh. I can see that, that, yeah, that's fine. I'm, I'm mm -hmm. just trying to understand what we can do and what we can't understand. Uh-huh. Yes. Yeah. Um, typically, it'll give you compile time errors for situations where you would have been getting undefined behavior anyway, and that is the ultimate goal of this library. Um, one other issue that uh, does come up is how do you handle constants? And the reason that this is an issue is because the type system does not look at values. Mm -hmm. So if you have this expression, a bounded integer between 0 and 10, and you add the literal 5 to it, the type of that is not a bounded integer between 5 and 15. It's actually a bounded integer between approximately plus or minus 2.1 billion um, because it uses the uh, numeric limits of an int, int max mm -hmm. and int min. Uh, so it gives you wide, wide bounds. Even though all of this can be done at compile time, the type system itself does not know about it. So uh, if you try to construct a bounded integer for each literal, that can get cumbersome pretty quickly. If you have, say, an array of 15 constants, you don't want to have to do something like this, specify the number three times, have this long type declaration. So there were a few approaches on how to solve this, and I ultimately settled on adding user-defined literals. Um, originally, I did not include it because uh, this factory function, uh, bounded make, is more general. Um, basically, it's a way to prevent yourself from having to repeat n three times, which could uh, you know, maybe it's not just uh, the number five. Maybe it's uh, the result of a constant expression function with four arguments. You don't want to have to specify that function so many times. Sometimes you can't store the result of it into some variable. Um, so this still exists as the general form to take the results of constant expression functions or other compile time constant variables. But when you compare what the code looks like with the factory function make, versus the bounded, uh, bounded integer literal. When you look at this, the emphasis is on, you know, you have some expression and you add the result of this function. But what's really going on here is you have some expression and you add five. And I feel that the user-defined literal really emphasizes that a lot. The five is what's important here. 
And then, you know, there's something special about its type, but the important thing is the five. Um, and what this gets you is basically it allows your bounds to remain small. If you just start adding literals to it, then unfortunately because of the way the type system works, because literals are all typed as int or larger, then that is one, one situation where you could run into situations where the, uh, the bounds begin to grow a lot faster than they really should be based on what the contents of these types are. Um, so a few uh, design decisions of this library were the underlying type. Um, this is what the forward declaration looks like. Um, we have this enum class that gives the storage type. It's either fast or least. And what that corresponds to is the integer types in the header C standard int. Um, all of that is actually abstracted away from my library through the boost integer library, where you can just specify uh, the largest value is this and the smallest value is this, and it gives you an underlying type of like, int least 8t or uint, six, uint fast 16t. So with fast, it's going to be the fastest type that's capable of storing it. Um, with least, the smallest type that's capable of storing it. Um, it's defaults to fast. On most systems, they're exactly the same. Um, but for instance, on uh, Cray system, old Cray systems and uh, ARM, uh, I believe, v4 and earlier, the, uh, it is possible to get um, smaller types than, uh, than the fastest type, but you pay a pretty significant performance penalty. For instance, on uh, ARM, you can get a 16-bit a integer, but access to 16-bit integers is significantly more expensive than access to 32-bit integers. So if you have, say, 120 fields, in this object and you're going to be storing a million of them and you're only accessing it maybe once a day. You don't care too much about the speed of that one access. What you care about is compacting everything into the smallest region of memory to improve your memory locality and your performance that way. Then you'd use least, but in most situations you just want the default fast. Um, another design decision was uh, inclusive bounds, also known as a closed range. So what that means is that when you say this, zero is a legal value and 10 is a legal value. So this might be a little surprising in some situations when you kind of think about, the most obvious example would be like C++ iterators, where begin points to the actual beginning of the range and then end is one pass to the end of the range. However, I feel that in general there actually is uh, more precedent for inclusive range for integer types uh, in C++, particularly with standard numeric limits here, the 0 represents standard numeric limits min. The 10 is standard numeric limits max. Uh, and also, uh, uniform int distribution, if any of you have used that. The bounds that you specify in the range of a uniform int distribution are included in that distribution. And the reasoning for that when they were designing the class was that if it were exclusive, if it were the half open range, or it included the first but not the last, it would be impossible to specify a distribution that actually includes that largest possible value. So I kind of followed that same reasoning here. Zero and 10 are both included. And in practice, as I've used this, I have found myself very rarely needing to do minus one. It's always kind of the logical value that I would put for the largest one is actually the value that I want in there, just as a personal experience for that. Do you, do you have a question? Um, another important part of this library, I feel, is that there are no implicit conversions to int or any other built-in integer type. Um, this helps avoid tricky implicit integral promotions, uh, avoids implicit narrowing. So for instance, if there were implicit conversions, then you know, maybe I have an integer type that represents the range 200 to 300. You know, the integer type is somewhere in that range. And so it implicitly converts to an int, and then it implicitly narrows to uh, an int 8t, even though that's not possible, a possible type that can represent any value in that range. This can happen, and on many compilers, it won't even warn you that any of this has happened. So there are no implicit conversions to built-in types. However, there are implicit conversions to larger bounded integer types. And I found this is very important to making the library usable in uh, just kind of day-to-day -day programming. So we can have a, a function here. It returns an integer between 0 and 10. 
And you know, if one condition is true, it returns zero. If some other condition is true, it returns six. Otherwise, it returns 10. It's perfectly safe. There's no reason to forbid it. It makes things a lot easier than having to have three static casts in there or constructors or anything like that. The code just reads a lot clearer. This function always returns a value between 0 and 10, and that's what it always does inside. Um, but there are some limitations of the library. If we change that previous declaration slightly to use C++14 automatic return type deduction, so we take off the, uh, the return type there and we try to do the same thing, then uh, GCC gives uh, error and consistent deduction for auto. Clang gives a similar message. And the reason for that is that when you use automatic return type deduction, all types have to be the same. So this, 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 they all have to be the exact same type. Um, this, I believe, is actually the most significant shortcoming or the biggest problem with using the library and making it easy to use. Um, the best way that I have found to work around this is basically just specify the type as this, hit compile, it says, oh, you know, can't convert this, expand the range, keep going through. Um, in this situation, it's really easy. You can see how it's 0 through 10. But as you start to replace, <coughs> sorry, as you start to replace uh, all of your other integer types with the bounded integer, you can create fairly complex expressions where you just say, you know, my input type for this is 0 through 100. My input type for that is 2 through 27. I do some operations on them. And I don't really care what the intermediate type is. I just know that it's the correct type. I don't have to worry about what that type is anymore. And unfortunately, this is one situation where that abstraction starts to, to leak away, where you do have to care, in a sense, just so you can specify it there. Um, another problem is with conditional statements. This statement right here fails to compile. And the reason is that when you use the conditional operator, where b is some Boolean, it tries to convert this to this, tries to convert this to this. There is no conversion there because there is no overlap of range. Neither one contains the range of the other. Um, so the only way around that, if you need a, particular, a single statement or a single expression, rather, um, would be to use a macro, unfortunately. Um, and ultimately, what this does is it's casting them to the common type of both. Um, I personally believe. Uh, well, first of all, the, the type of this is an integer between 1 and 2, as you'd expect. Now, I personally believe the real problem here is in the definition of the conditional operator. Um, with C++11, we've added the uh, type trait standard common type. And it's defined for all of the built-in types, and really every type, if you don't specialize it, as being the type of the result of the conditional operator. Whereas I feel it makes a lot more sense to define the type of the conditional operator as being the type of common type. I don't know if there's really any code that that would break because common type is fairly new. Um, generally, situations where a user would specialize common type, which is the only time that these two are different, is, based, is right now the conditional operator either would fail to compile or would give incorrect results. and the library vendor just has to tell the user, you know, don't use the conditional operator. Um, yeah. Uh, another issue uh, kind of came up uh, earlier a little bit kind of indirectly would be that you cannot use a, a bounded integer as a non-type template parameter. Um, literal class types cannot be non-type template parameters. Uh, I believe there is a proposal to change that, where if your class has a const expression constructor, um, there has been a proposal that it could then be used as a non-type template parameter. So for instance, this right here does not compile. X has to be an int or a float or a pointer to something. It can't actually be a class type, even though the compiler knows exactly what that value is at compile time. Um, so in that case, you'd have to use a static cast it to explicitly cast to a built-in type, or um, there's also a value member function that returns the underlying, t a value in the underlying type to kind of work around this. And then uh, also, as we mentioned earlier, the range is limited to uh, int max t. Um, so this does limit some values. For instance, uh, 
if you're using uint max t, the largest unsigned type, then uh, very large values will not fit in the bounded integer. Um, it also does not support any floating point types, um, which in some situations might seem like kind of an obvious extension. You know, if you could parameterize the type to where instead of always being a, an integer, you could make a, a bounded float. Um, you know, kind of the classic example for that would be you could have a, a floating point value that's always between 0 and 360, and that represents degrees. And when you go over, it wraps around. However, that runs into a lot of issues. Um, I don't know how many of you have uh, read uh, what every computer scientist should know about floating point values, but in it, it has a, a pretty important statement where for this to work, <coughs> for a floating point value to work as these bounds, one of the assumptions is that if one floating point value compares less than another floating point value, then if you don't change their values, it will always compare less than another floating point value, but that's not true. You can actually assign a value if bounded integer allowed this. You could assign a floating point value to your bounded float, and it's in range. But then as soon as you actually store it in the bounded float, due to conversion from, say, an 80-bit register to a 64-bit memory location, now it's larger than your range, and your constraint is violated. It was a way to work around the type system, so it was actually an intentional choice on my part to not support floating point values. Um, it's not to say that those issues can't be worked around. You can write fancy code through casting to a reference to volatile that works around those issues, but then you pay a performance penalty everywhere, and then it doesn't meet its original principle of zero overhead. Um, so, you know, maybe that is a, a possible way to expand it in the future if someone who's a little bit smarter than I am with floating point would be able to add that in. Um, so, uh, yeah, there's, a, again, a link where you can get it. There's an email. You can email me with any questions. Does anybody have any questions for me right now? Yes. Uh-huh. Yeah, so the, uh, my understanding of the boost, uh, the multi-precision library is that it is uh, an arbitrary sized integer library. Is that? Yes, that it sound? is arbitrary, but you can compile time check or boost mm -hmm. yeah, Uh-huh. So um, what this library adds that I believe no other library does is the automatic computation of new bounds from the expressions of using others. So for instance, uh, you can multiply two integers and the bounds are automatically expanded to fit the correct size. You can uh, use the function max and it will take the, uh, the maximum of the minimums and the maximum of the maximums to compute a new type. Or the abs function will uh, make sure that the resulting type is always zero through something. Like it adds a lot of uh, bounds checking in there that I don't believe that the, uh, the boost uh, multi-precision library has. Any, any other questions? How do you do checking on construction? Um, is there a way or do you have different constructors for when you're constructing where the input value is a um, constant expression versus when it's some other variable? So the, the question was how do I handle constructing different values and checking the constraints? So uh, unfortunately, you cannot overload on the const expressionness of function parameters. So regardless of whether it is known at compile time, you have to write your function as though it might not be. Um, but what it can do is, uh, by way of uh, primarily enable if um, on the constructor, if the range of the value that you're trying to assign to it is the same size or smaller, then you can construct it implicitly with no checks. If there is overlap, but not, but there are some out of bounds ranges, or some, yeah, some out of bounds values, then it, uh, it's an explicit constructor that does use your policy. <coughs> and uh, you can also specify, for instance, that, um, you know, 
it's not necessarily an error to assign out of bounds. For instance, the clamp policy has that, where uh, if you have a value that's clamped between 0 and 10, so if you try to assign something larger, it'll just be 10. It's not necessarily an error to assign something larger. So in that case, uh, by way of using uh, the policy traits, it, uh, it can determine, oh, OK, you know, even if there is no overlap, I'm still going to allow you to assign it and apply the policy to it. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I, but I, then I'm also wondering, is there any trick when you know that you're coming from a literal, like when you're using your user-defined literal, uh -huh. is there any way to, to turn that into a compile time check then instead of a runtime check? Yeah, so if you're using uh, the user-defined literal or if you're using that make factory function with yeah. the, the template uh, integer value, yeah, yeah. then there is no check there at all because then it knows the exact value that's being used. Yes. Yeah. So the, you assign it to another type, you can see a compile time if they out Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, yeah. Using the user defined literal really was kind of the, the main motivation for that, was allowing these compile time constants to have the single value as the whole range with no checks associated with creating it. Okay. I do have a, oh, yes. Um, so the um, policy class uh, is actually pretty straightforward. It just has a, um, like for instance, you have a member function assignment that checks when you're doing just plain assignment. Um, and that class really can be anything. Like if you wanted, you could implement your policy class to look something up in a database, pop open a window and ask the user, is this value a good value? Or register a callback function that's called to, uh, to determine something else and then have that callback function be changeable at runtime. Um, there's really no limits placed on what the policy class can do other than that it matches the particular function signature. Does that kind of answer? OK. Yes. Okay, so the question was uh, if you wanted to do just kind of regular arithmetic in it, then the ultimate effect of this library is that it cuts the range of integers in half because the resulting type is always going to be uh, for addition, anyway, the sum of the maxes will be the uh, the new maximum. And my answer to that would be kind of because um, the resulting type actually does have to have that extra size in there. But in reality, if you try to add these up and they actually could be that large, if both of them could be that large, you would get integer overflow. Um, there is the ability to specify um, a non-checking constructor to where, um, like for instance, if you have a, the uh, situation where one of these integers is always large, but if it is, then the other one is small. So we know that there's never going to be any overflow, but there's not any way to express just based on the bounds of these two. Then you can add them up and construct them into, uh, into a new type where you specify the bounds and say, you know, don't check the bounds for me. I know that this is in range based on knowledge that the compiler can't have. Yes. Uh, I, think, uh, wait, I don't know if Jeff was asking this, but it might be the same thing. Uh -huh. uh, 
So the question ultimately was um, basically we have been using these kind of built-in integers for a while and they work pretty well. And so in practice, we generally don't encounter overflow. Um, but using this library, we could get compile time errors for something that in reality might not be a problem. Is that, is that a good summary of? OK. So. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yeah, so then you uh, basically at that point you're trying to say that, at least in my opinion, that you don't really want to track the bounds of your operations. And as soon as you don't track the bounds of your operations, then it becomes very difficult to basically not check them when you don't need to. So for instance, if you are writing a moon lander and you have 16 kilobytes of memory, then you care about making sure that your integers are as small as possible. And you can use int everywhere and say, you know, good enough, but then, you know, maybe that puts you at 20 kilobytes instead of 16. So then you have to manually go through and shrink them all down. Actually, the reason that I wrote this library in terms of C++ application was that I had a video game playing program that analyzed the state of the game and tried to determine what the best possible move was. And so what its strategy entailed was basically try a whole bunch of stuff, and if it doesn't work, go back to a previous state, which meant copying a lot of data, so it had a previous <coughs> state to go to. When I switched from using int everywhere, originally I just kind of used the C standard int integers to try to manually optimize space. Uh, I said, oh, okay, you know, this one is always going to be pretty small, this is going to be medium size, so int 8t and 16t. Then I saw a s several orders of magnitude improvement in runtime because I was then able to reduce the size of my data structures to fit into, say, you know, maybe this data structure fits in a 64 byte cache line where before it was 80 bytes. Um, or, you know, it, there's just less cache evictions, more data locality. Um, so the, then after I wrote this library, I then ported that into it. And I actually found quite a few situations where my assumptions were violated. Um, but I think maybe a more general answer to your question is probably necessary here. And I think that um, Probably the most common type of bug really is an integer overflow bug, even if we don't always think about it that way. Um, it's not necessarily overflowing the type int, but it's with arrays. So you have an array that is a size of 10, say. Um, I believe the correct type to index that with then would be an integer that's always between 0 and 9. So it seems to me anyway from reading uh, cert vulnerabilities and uh, Microsoft patches and various uh, other issues where we have a serious situation where we have remote code execution arbitrary, code execution privilege escalation, then what really happened a lot of the time was that we are writing past memory that we thought was ours, but it really isn't. And the programmer used the index operator instead of the at function of, say, an array, like standard array, because they didn't want to have checks everywhere. So what this library allows as a practical use case would be to define a bounded array, which is actually included in the library, um, where if you are indexing it 
with the index type or something that's guaranteed to be smaller than the index type, there are no checks. It's no different from just a regular array index. But for convenience, there's also this app member function that accepts any type of integer and it casts it to the index type, which is a checked integer, which throws on out of bounds access. So you can use this and get a compile time error if the compiler can't be sure it'll be safe. Or you can use this, get no overhead in the case where the bounds are guaranteed to be in place, or get a runtime error in the case where they're not necessarily in the case. Right here. This uh, static cast to index t, which is a checked integer, calls the constructor. The constructor has a check if this is out of bounds. So like this sort of uh, interface design often comes up when you start using the bounded integer library, where you have kind of one kind of function that accepts the exact type that you need, and then a template function that accepts other things and then performs checking. Mm -hmm. it becomes the most yeah, there's always, there's always an escape hatch in here with either the non-check constructor or, you know, something like this if you want to add a runtime error or things like that. Is there any other questions? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so the the checked integer type has the throw policy where it throws an exception on out of bounds access. Um, That's just a, a type def to prevent you from having to say bounded integer zero size minus one bounded throw policy. Just by having that multiple namespace in there, I felt that it started to expand the types to get really long. And so for, for the common policies here, throw policy or clamp policy, the, uh, the alias templates really helped simplify the implementation quite a bit. Yes. There's a, there's a clamp policy. Is there also some sort of rollover policy? Yes. So the, uh, the question was, there's a clamp policy. Uh, is there also a rollover or a modulo policy? Uh, and the answer to that is not yet. Uh, that is uh, something I'm hoping to add probably next week. I just didn't have time to, uh, to get it in there as I was adding in some other stuff to it. But that is definitely my, uh, my highest priority policy to add. That seems like the, the most obvious addition. Um, any other questions about how to use it or um, implementation questions? Yes. Actually, um, does it play nicely with like size t, the things that um, you know, for loops would expect? And okay. Like that? The question was, does it play nicely with size t and what for loops would expect and things like that? Um, the uh, answer to that, I believe. Um, also goes back a little bit to the um, kind of bare, to the metal, no extra syntax heritage from C, where kind of the typical for loop is, you know, for int i equals zero, i does not equal 10, plus plus i, um, where you specify all of those things independently. Um, one issue that does come up with this um, is when you are trying to iterate over, say, a whole bunch of values, then if you did use that for loop with, you know, i is 0, i does not equal 10, plus plus i, then you would have to specify the type of your index as being 0 through 10. But when you're actually using it inside of the loop, its value is never 10. It just needs that 10 value there as the termination condition. And so uh, one thing that one other thing that I did add to the library is an integer range function, uh, similar to the, uh, the range function in Python, if you're familiar with that. Um, you can just say, you know, integer range 5, and it gives you the first five integers. Um, so the type that is returned from that range, you can use it in a range-based for loop. So you can say for um, auto i colon integer range 5. Um, and the type that's actually returned as your value is an integer between 0 and 4, because that is the actual type that you'll get out. But internally, it holds on to an integer between 0 and 5, so it can hold that terminating condition. 
Does that kind of answer what you were asking about? OK. Yeah, so one, uh, one other thing that kind of was interesting, and uh, for those of you who were at the previous slide about um, generic programming and generic spaces, I believe is what it was titled, um, he talked a lot about worrying about compile time. And that actually was also something else that I paid pretty close attention to in designing this library. Um, and the biggest source of um, issues in terms of compile time was with a uh, make array function. It's been proposed for standardization uh, several times, I guess, where you have a function, you pass in a whole bunch of things to it, and it deduces the type and the size of the array. So with bounded integer, the type deduction is a little bit more complicated because you want to be able to say, you know, I want to make an array of this set of values. This value is 5, this value is 2, this value is 10. And ideally, you'd want that array uh, of bounded integers to be able to deduce the correct minimum and maximum to where it can hold any of those values. And um, so that was one other situation where C14 actually gave a pretty significant compile time performance improvement. Um, one of the lesser known features that was added is um, relaxed rules on braces and in initializing aggregates. Um, so originally, if you had, say, an array of array of arrays, you would need, uh, I believe, six sets of braces total. Um, one, two for each set of arrays, because the array itself contains an array. So you need two braces for each array, and then it's nested arrays. Um, so generating the correct structure in a variadic template to create that actually led to minutes of compile time and over four gigabytes of memory used. Uh, with C++14 braces, it's a lot easier. You can just say brace and stick it in there, and it kind of figures out the correct dimensions for everything. And then it was a few seconds and under a gigabyte of memory used for a particular compilation unit. It wasn't used entirely on, on that. Uh, but yeah, um, so I believe that is, uh, that is my time. So thank you all for coming. <laughs>